This is Support is Sexy, episode 201, with filmmaker, author, and photographer, Alicia Cunningham. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. You know, it just would not be the same without you. And I am so excited about our guest today, Alicia Cunningham. And Alicia and I connected actually on Twitter when she sent me a message or not a message. She mentioned me and shared her project. I am more than my hair. I got to tell you, I watched the video and I was so taken by it. One, because it challenges the quote unquote standards of beauty that are in media and society, but also because she is celebrating bald women. And these are women who either are living with cancer or they've shaved their heads and chosen to be bald. They're supporting someone who might have cancer or another condition. They're women who have alopecia. And I related to it because I am someone who has alopecia, which is an autoimmune disease. And you can read more about that if you go to the link on Alicia's episode. But it was really nice to see someone sort of tackling this in a beautiful way and sharing women's stories, which you know I'm all about. So Alicia talks to us today about putting this project together, what pushed her or what motivated her, what inspired her to do this, and a lot of great information if you are someone who's thinking about creating a documentary or a film that chronicles someone's life. So on this episode, what you'll learn from Alicia is how to be open to expanding your project beyond your original vision, smart resources to support your documentary, Fiscal sponsorship, what it means and how it can support your project. Great advice about that. How to use your art for social good. The value of involving family, especially your children, in your business. Also, great tips on how to find a good coach and why a coach may be able to give you more than you even thought you needed. And lastly, the importance of understanding your mindset as it relates to your business. So I know you're going to love this episode. Great story from Alicia. Great project that I hope you all will support. To find out more information about what she has created, you know you can go to supportissexypodcast.com. Just search for Alicia, A-L-Y-S-C-I-A, and her show notes page will pop up. But for now, without further ado, Alicia Cunningham. So Alicia, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. So first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? I first, first fell in love with entrepreneurship. Um, I would say I didn't know it at that time, but I was uh, from as young as I can remember, I was about six. Um, I used to go door to door with my grandfather. So my grandfather's an entrepreneur. Um, as a matter of fact, most of the people in my family are entrepreneurs, but um, he used to sell the first uh, filtered home filtered water system. That at that time, NASA made it. Mm. And I used to go with him door to door to do door sales. Um, and that's how he made his sales was from going door to door. And I enjoyed going walking with him, not just walking with him, but then also just be, being able to meet other people in the neighborhood that I probably would not have met otherwise. Um, so that was like my first introduction to entrepreneurship. Did you understand yeah. at that time what it was? Did you have conversations about it or did you know you just were spending time with your grandpa and seeing how he worked every day? Um, I just know I was spending time with him and mm-hmm. I and I saw him um I think the the benefit of that also was that um I got to see he would talk to me along the way though as he was selling he was like you know cuz some people were rude mm-hmm. and he's like you know he just kept on going so he was like you don't let if anybody's you know, rude or whatever he's like you don't bother with them they're probably having a bad day so just go to go to the next one <laughs> that's it What do you yeah. feel like that taught you if anything about um that sort of resilience to rejection um, it gave me a tough show, you know, and I noticed it didn't, it wasn't until I got older, I, start, I started doing network marketing, maybe in my early 20s, and, um, which was similar to what he was doing, because it was really network marketing, and um, I realized that I didn't, it didn't really bother me if someone said no, it was like, all right, well, just keep on going, um, and people used to always commend me on those, like, how do you, you know, a lot of people are scared to do cold calls, and I didn't mind, but it wasn't until I had to, I had to really sit and think about it, I was like, wow, I've learned that from my grandfather, I learned that from 
like going for those walks with him when I was a kid and didn't, didn't realize that I connected the dots then. Right. Yeah. Where did you grow up? Yeah. Um, so I grew up in Queens, um, New York. Oh, Queens. I have yeah. family in Queens. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I grew I, up there. I've lived in Maryland for uh, quite some time. My family's from Trinidad. Okay. Yeah. What would you say a young Alicia was like growing up? Hmm. Young Alicia. I was just talking about this yesterday. Um, <laughs> I was always straightforward, like always direct. So I remember as a kid, um, then sometimes even getting in trouble because they would say like you're, you're too rude your mouth is too rude mm-hmm. but not that it was rude but it was just I was always like well no no I think this this is how I feel I think this is you know and I would always I was always expressive um and I always loved from what I remember sitting down I love hearing people's stories like my elders I like knowing where they grew up like what was it like in Trinidad um what are the things that they did as a kid um so I always loved storytelling um so it's funny that now as an adult I also put that into my occupation as what I do now. What would you say yeah. were some of your greatest influences growing up? My greatest influences, I have to say um, both my parents. Um, my mother was, I don't remember my mother before she had a stroke because she had a stroke when she was 25 and I was just two at that time. Mm. And um, my mother was a very determined woman. Like She was determined to get what she wanted. She, was, she did everything. She cooked, she drove, um, never complained. And um, no matter how hard or challenging things were, she just constantly kept going. Like there was never like, I can't do it, you know? So I learned that from her. Um, And I would also say my dad, he was always very positive. He, um, he always, there was like never any limits for me. It was always like, you know, you can do anything. So I never had, I never lived in a box. Right. You know, I was, for me, it was limitless. And then my grandparents as well, because I felt like they really were the foundation of family and marriage um, cause I learned from them now that they're, you know, married 65 years now, I felt like I developed, um, understanding of relationships and just sol- solidifying, um, what family meant through them. With your mom, did they ever find out, um, what exactly caused her stroke? Did they know? Yeah. So she had an aneurysm. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And she was 25. So she had three of us, three, me and my two brothers at that time. Um, but so, you know, an aneurysm, just if, if in case anyone doesn't know, that's when, uh, a vessel, uh, a vein actually, uh, uh, um, I don't want to say when it explodes, but it um it bursts, it bursts right mm-hmm. in your brain, right? And hers burst on the right side of her vein, so it affected the left side of her body. So she has she was paralyzed at first; she couldn't talk, she couldn't um, walk anything. Um, but now, you know, after a few months, she still has paralysis on her left side, mm-hmm. but um, it's you know she's able to walk, but she just you know she drags her foot then as she walks. It sounds like the people in your family have been such an example of this um, keep going spirit. Yes, definitely. Definitely learned that. <laughs> yeah. So for you, what about um, photography? Because I know photography and as you said, storytelling is such a part of your life and what you do now. Was that a part of your life in childhood as well? Or when did you become fascinated by it? Um, I became fascinated with photography once I actually when I went into college and I took it as a, um, a general course. I just mm-hmm. took it as an art elective. And I loved being, in, I still do, I love being in the dark room. I like seeing my negatives. I like actually taking the time to take a picture to make sure that, that the quality comes out right. And um, I fell in love with it then. And I also love the fact that in my photography, I've always focused on people. That was always my focus from the very beginning. Um, and um, and once again, like hearing the stories of them as I spoke, as we connected, you know, as we sat and spoke or as I took the image, we would talk. So that was always intriguing to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was um, your plan when you went to school, though? You said that you took photography as a general course. Did mm-hmm. you have another idea of what you were going to do or another career path you had in mind, which most of us usually do? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of uh, in a few things that I wanted to do. Initially, from a child up until um, high school, I wanted to be a veterinarian. So I wanted to go to school for to get my doctors um, to have my own practice. Mm. And then um, uh, going to, after realizing how many years of school I had to do I was like oh I don't think I want to do this um so I ended up switching I wanted to do art I just wasn't sure because I've always loved art um I love animals I love art and I was trying to figure out so what it would be so that's why I ended up taking an elective and um so I was doing graphic design I was like okay I'll do um I actually thought I would do physical therapy at first as well and then um all things I felt like had to do with my hands anything where I can be creative and then after taking that photography course that's what I was like this is this is what I want to do 
And then, so what did you do, say, after college? What was the first kind of position that, that you had, or did you go immediately into creative work? Yeah, after college, actually, straight from high school, because at that time, which they don't have now, um, at that time they had this program called Work Study. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe some college, some yeah. high schools still do. They do, okay. Um, so I was working for the government. I was working for the Department of Commerce at that time, um, but I was doing design work. So I was like creating flyers, office work as well, and um, I also was like the, had the responsibility of uh, registering guns when people would travel. Mm. Um, so that was I did. I went from there from the Department of Commerce to college at Morgan State. I decided that wasn't for me. So I left Morgan State, wanted to do a local college. And then I started working um, for the Department of the Interior, uh, working with the Division of Indian Indian Affairs, which was advocating to um, Native American land in their territory. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, I did like I did contract and I was always a contractor. Um, so I did the BET, then I did um, the US Postal and a few other companies and organizations. Um, and then I went into media which was, you know, like Nat Geo and AOL, um, Discovery Channel. And that was all as a contractor as well. Wow. So for yeah. primarily now, do you still do contract work in addition to your own creative work? Um, I still do. So I do contract work, not necessarily because before when I was getting to the media, I was doing um, uh, photo editing. Mm-hmm. So I don't do that anymore because I focus more so on my own personal projects um, with it, which is like now, now with the film and with my second book. So that's my focus there. Um, but I also, besides that, which people don't really know, they even know of one or the other. I own a, I own a um, construction company, residential. Oh, um, right. So that's Hello. my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like my bread and butter. Um, but it's still art for me because it's still I'm still being able to create. You know, I'm able to create. Tell so. me about the construction company. How did that come about? Is it a family business or something that you ended up developing on your own? Um, so it is family, I mean, so my husband and I are in the business together. Mm-hmm. And initially, because I do come from that background with um, builders, you know, I mean, guys from the Caribbean, that's really pretty much a good, it's art or construction, they, they're handy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I grew up, that's my background. And um, I happened to marry someone who happens to be a, 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 a master carpenter. Um, and so several years ago, I was always helping him with the business. And I was like, well, you know, I think, let's just launch our own company. So I mm. launched it, took the, uh, got my license five years ago and launched a the company then. So, you know, to, we work together now. What kind of license yes. do you get for that? Is it a, a certain license yes. to practice construction or to? Yeah, so it's a contractor's license. Contractor's um, license. Yeah, so I have a Maryland contractor's license to do renovation, which is just home improvement, and then also to do new construction. But it's, it's only for residential. Okay, and how many years have you guys had that business together? That's been five years now. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah thank you. And thank I love, you. love, too, how you combine what you and your husband both sort of do or are passionate about and created it into something that works for you both to provide right. for you. Yes, yes, exactly. Because it was important for me. Um, what I didn't like when I was doing the 9 to 5, um, even as a contractor, was the fact that my, I, didn't, I wasn't spending enough time with my children. And that was mm-hmm. important for me, you know, so I was like, we got to figure something out, you mm-hmm. know, that we can do on our own. How old are your children now? So they're 5, 10, 15. 5, 10, 15. Yeah. I right. love it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. with your photography, as far as mm-hmm. images, I know um, showcasing natural images is very important to you. Yeah. Why is that something that matters to you? Um, I think, well, first of all, um, the media does not do a good job of showing uh, images of, I think, natural beauty. And I remember, remember as a little girl, not seeing, and even now, um, you know, 37 years later, not seeing images that reflect me as beautiful on the TV or in the media in general. And um, I remember also my own personal story, because I always say there's a story connected to your passion. Mm-hmm. And um, as a little girl, I, I went through an experience that made me question beauty, what, you know, what is beautiful and doubting that I was beautiful. Um, and in turn, what I wanted to do was to create something that I felt can be empowering for others and for particularly females, because I'm a woman, you know, and um, I relate to women and I relate to what we go through and I relate to the pressures that we deal with in society in general. Um, so I just wanted to create something that just shows who we are naturally and not this whole crazed Photoshop thing. Right. You know, um, and then I had another experience besides that. Um uh, with a professional photographer, she's a really well-known photographer, and she saw a picture, an image I took of a lady. Um, it's titled "Life," and I saw so I have a ankh on her stomach, 
and she's pregnant. And she, this photographer looked at my image and she said to me, um, you should never give a woman a picture of her pregnant belly with a stretch mark on it. And I just thought it was so crazy to me, but she was serious. And she told me that, you know, so I'm asked her, why would I not give a woman a picture of her stretch mark when she's pregnant? Like it comes naturally with the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, you know, because it doesn't sell. And um, I didn't, that was like kind of a hard hit for me because I realized that not only is society pushing it, but also individuals. So these photographers are also, you know, like supporting this and telling the, their clients that this is better or they can do this so we can get rid of your wrinkle. And I just thought it was ridiculous, you know, so um, I wanted to create something that really just fosters our authenticity, you know, in general. How do your subjects, um, the people you photograph, respond to um, knowing that this is the way that you uh, shoot them and also present them? Are most people open to it? Because, And I ask because mm -hmm. we live in such a, quote unquote, filtered society now, right? Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. And that's the funny thing, because when I was working on my first project, uh, Feminine Transitions, that was one of the, the main deciding factors in women saying they're not going to participate. It was like, no, nope, if you're not going to, you know, Photoshop me, or well, they didn't say Photoshop, but, you know, somehow change or get rid of my wrinkle, I'm not going to participate. If I can't wear makeup, forget about it. Mm. Um, so uh, in turn, I just made sure that that's, I'm, I make that really clear in the beginning, that this is not what I'm doing. And, um, and because of that, also, I focus my work on my own personal projects, or unless it's something like, unless it's a editorial shoot. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't do personal work for people because I don't think that there's there's a small market for it with, with clients that I have. But I don't I don't um, um, promote photography or as high even on my website. I have people um, uh, it says on there contact me for editorial um, shoot um, or for an editorial assignment. But because, you know, that's not really in demand. That's not what people want. They want the whole, you know, glitz and glamour in the edited version of themselves. Right. You know? Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Now, Feminine yeah. Transitions was also your first book, right? Yes, it was. And that, how many women were featured in there? There were 64 women total featured, girls and women, so all ages. All ages, right, because it went from young young girls to older women. Yes. All beautiful. Yes. <laughs> all right. Seven weeks, 103. I was going to say, seven weeks, 103. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. So now tell us about your latest project, which is how you and I were in touch, which I'm so right. excited about. Tell me about yes. Yeah, tell me about your latest project and, and what's exciting to you about it. I am more than my hair. Yes. So I am more than my hair is what I'm doing is really so it's another um, platform that I feel that is really another form of transitioning. Um, it has to do with women and it's just a different transition that some of us may go through. Um, and it's also just challenging social society on what the ideal beauty is. And we often don't see, actually, I, I don't see women um, in the media that are bald. And usually if a woman is bald, um, she's associated with cancer. Um, and I came up with the idea originally because in 2013, actually, when I was producing or getting ready to launch my first book with Feminine Transitions, I met up with a woman that owns a nonprofit organization um, for, and the proceeds that she raises goes towards uh, cancer treatment for women of color because there's a there's not that many resources for women of color unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So she was doing a big chop, um, and a big chop is when you cut your hair in support of an organization, and the proceeds goes towards that organization. And she was just casually talking to me about um, uh, the big chop, and you know she was looking for participants. So I volunteered to cut my hair, which at that time was I had locks of 16 years. It was you know way past my waist, and I was like, well you know I'm ready to cut my hair, and why not do it for a good cause. Um, so what I did was I posted it on social media and then I also said that she's looking for other participants and I blogged about it and the response that I received from people, strangers and also from loved ones was not so encouraging and mm -hmm. um, I kept hearing things like, uh, you know, you shouldn't cut your hair because a woman's hair is her crown and glory and that's a woman's hair is her beauty and I just thought I was overwhelmed with um, I was, uh, with just so many, out with negativity, you know, and um I told this one woman, I kind of stopped on her tracks and I said to her, what would you do if your daughter lost her hair involuntarily? You know, would you tell her that she's not beautiful anymore? You know, so um, that those those thoughts and the, the conversation that I had actually led me to I'm more than my hair. Um, and I wanted to just highlight that we our hair is not our crown of glory and it is not our beauty. And um, and hopefully in turn that the work that I've created, the project that I've created, which is the documentary and the photography book, just um 
brings awareness to, to just different forms of beauty. And one happens to be a bald woman, you know. Right. And that was in yeah. 2000, around 2013, right? Yes. That's when I cut it. 2013. Wow. So what was yeah. the, what was the, um, did the woman that you asked her about her daughter, I'm just curious, did she or anybody else give a response to what would you do if your child or loved one lost their hair involuntarily? Because I think that's what people don't think about. Right. And she did, she, for a while, she, she thought about it. <laughs> so it kind of, she really thought about it. And then she said, well, you know, that's a different situation. Is it, she lost it involuntarily, then it'll, it'll, that, that's a different story. But I don't think people should cut their hair you know, unless they lost it, but you know, why should the, why would you cut your hair involuntarily if you didn't, if you're not losing your hair? So it was, it was still kind of like back to point A, but for at least for those few seconds, she thought about it, right. you know, um, which I felt like is the whole reason why, or why it's op- important to open up the discussion, mm-hmm. you know, have the discussion. But it's still tied yeah. to, it's not as beautiful as if you have hair. It's yes. like, which is not right. a fault of her. I mean, as, as you said, I think earlier, right. it's, we are just we're pushed that message so much, you know, outside of our community, within our right. community by so many people. Right. Yes. Yeah. So now you're also raising money for I am more than my hair, right? On Indiegogo. Yes, I am. I'm, I launched an Indiegogo campaign to raise the money for the production of the film and my photography book. Um, and all the money raised there will go towards actually producing it, which I didn't realize because I just kind of got. Uh, I feel like I just kind of went into the film world and didn't realize the the production the cost. Oh yes, yeah. I didn't. I didn't think about that. But I'm, I mean, I, I'm loving it. I'm enjoying it. You know. Um, did, did you start right away with working on the project once you went through that experience in 2013? Did you know at that time I'm going to do? You know, my next project is a book and documentary about women who are bald and beautiful. Actually, when I first started, I did immediately after that. I was like, you know, I did, but I just started putting it out there in the universe. I was telling everyone I'm going to work on this project. If you know of anybody. Let me know if you have any suggestions where I can find participants. Um, let me know. And um, right after that, but initially it was just going to be the book. And so what happened was I contacted a local nonprofit organization that focuses on on, um, on helping documentary filmmakers. But even if you're not working on a documentary, if you have footage, they want you to you can apply to show your footage if they you know, if they, if they feel like it appeals to their audience mm-hmm. and they can and the audience gives you feedback. So um, I contacted Docs in Progress and I sent them my footage that I was going to use. Um, I was originally doing filming just for as promo for my um, book. Like I was going to do that for my, um, uh, just to put on YouTube. So um, as I'm there and I'm showing the footage and I'm asking everyone, you know, like, what do you think? And um, I turned around afterwards and uh, there was a, a one lady that was like, why is this not a documentary? So I was like, well, you know, I'm just doing it, you know, just as prom- promotion for my book. And she was like, but you should really consider. And then everybody in the audience was kind of like on the same, um, gave me the same feedback. Like, you should really consider making this a documentary because I've never seen anything like it before. Mm. Um, so that's how I ended up doing the documentary. It wasn't initially my plan. But um, after the footage, which I found out as I was doing the pictures, I really enjoyed doing the filming. Um, I would say even a lot more than the pictures um, at that time. But that's how it ended up becoming, you know, both. Wow. And what do you feel yeah. like you loved it, uh, about, you said you loved it more than, ju- or as much or more than doing the pictures. What was it? Was it the storytelling aspect that you've always been drawn to? That's exactly what it was. Because with the pictures, even though we get to speak, a lot of times we have to pause so I can take the images. But with the filming, I actually got to hear their stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can speak casually. And um and I feel like really draw a connection in similarities um, that we have a, a lot of similar stories from other women. And even though we come from various backgrounds, but a lot of our stories are similar. What, like what we think about ourselves, our family um, background, our history. And um, for me, that was powerful. And I was like, well, you know, this is it was at that point. I was like, I'm definitely doing this. You know? Right. Yeah. What was the documentary uh, or the program rather that you mentioned that you found and how did you find it for anyone listening who might be able to to find something like that in their area? Um, yeah, so it's called um, Docs in Progress. And but there's also other nonprofit organizations such as um, Women in Film and Video. And you also have documentary filmmakers. So I would say that anyone in their area with the best thing for them to do would be to Google um, nonprofit documentary um, filmmaker organizations. Um, and then they can find it like that. Excellent. Great advice. Yeah. Now, what would you say was um, the most revealing or enlightening about the project as you were doing it and getting to know these women? Um, the most revealing that, that um, 
that's the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that um, a lot of the women said that they were taking a picture for the first time without their wig on. Mm. And um, so for me, it was actually, um, and I'm always relating it to feminine transitions because it was feminine transitions was like the my first introduction to how serious uh, the whole I, women and beauty is the issue of women and beauty. Right. And I felt like being in front of the camera without their makeup and being forced to to be just with themselves and the camera and nothing else to be bare was it was like um, shedding layers. Mm-hmm. And I felt now with I am more than my hair, the similarity is also shedding layers and shedding layers is taking the wig off, um, which is not easy, you know, for I would say for anyone. So I commend them on that. And it's, and it's an honor to be a part of their story, you know, and that they trust me enough to say, I'm going to share with you not only my story, but also sh- shed a layer for you to see me. Um, so that was like, a, I feel like a defining moment for me. And the women who yeah. are featured in the uh, in the book and also in the documentary, are they uh, women who mainly suffer or are going through uh, living with cancer? Or is it women who may have lost hair because of cancer, alopecia, other things, or women who have chosen to go bald? Um, so it's all. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I made sure specifically to focus on different um, uh, situations. Mm-hmm. So there's one woman who lost her hair from chemotherapy. Um, another woman um, has alopecia and, and another woman who's also a good friend initially had alopecia, but then she was diagnosed with cancer. Mm-hmm. And she said that the one thing that she wasn't scared of is, is losing her hair because she had already, she had already lost her hair, right. um, you know, from alopecia. Um, and then there was another woman who is, um, had initially taken medication for, um, cause she started going blind in her, uh, uh, 30s mm. and the medication actually caused her to lose her hair. Um, so, and then there's another woman who cut her hair in solidarity of her friend who was diagnosed with breast cancer. So it's like all different, um, stories, you know, all different reasons. Right. What do you, yeah. what do you think people misunderstand most about women who experience baldness for whatever reason? Um, they just associate, you know, everyone just seems to associate um, baldness with cancer, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I was like, I can't think about it because before this project, I myself didn't even know about alopecia. Mm-hmm. So um, it's just really the fact that we don't, we're not educated, we don't know, you know, and um, so for me, it's really about bringing awareness that it's not, and, and, and in fact, also through this project, I learned from talking to a uh, dermatologist who is going to, who's featured in this as well is that all baldness is considered alopecia. So whether, whatever the diagnosis, um, it's all alopecia. So that's just to help them bring awareness, you know. Interesting. And it's funny because when you sent me, when we were in touch on social media and you, I saw the project and looked at the video, I think I responded and said, oh, as a woman who has alopecia, this right. is something that I'm definitely interested in. And yes. you're like, I didn't even know. I didn't know. Right? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Some people experience it in certain spots. And that's what I have, even though it's, it's oh. interesting now it's growing back. I don't know if it's relocating, change of diet, oh. whatever. You know, I think that's something that we all have to do, too, is experiment with what could be the reason if you don't know directly that it's caused by something else. Stress right. is another yes. thing for me. It enhances it if it, you know, if I have very stressful moments for a long period, mm-hmm. I can tell the difference in hair texture, not to make it all about me, but just no, no, so no. people know, yeah, everybody yes. has, you know, different experiences with their hair. And I, I go through, have gone through and go through phases too, where it can have, um, you feel a sense of insecurity uh, oh. about your hair, you know, of going out or taking pictures or certain angles and that kind of thing. So I think in uh. misunderstanding, that's the thing that some people don't consider either. And it's not that you're attached to your hair, but you want right. to feel like your most beautiful self. Right. Yeah. And, th- and that makes sense. And it's funny that you mentioned that because um, also through this project, um, talking to women and um, hearing their stories, they kept on saying, you know, they had a, they started off with a quarter size ball spot. Right. And um, I remember going through a very stressful period right when my daughter was born, um, right before she was born. And um, at that time I had locks, but I had um, one of my locks had f- uh, fell out and um, I had a quarter size ball spot. So it was as they were talking about it, and I was looking for it online. Um, and I remember seeing it because my doctor didn't know. And she was like, I don't know, it looks like ringworm, but it's not like a ringworm because I can't, you know, it's, it's smooth. It's, it's really smooth. It doesn't, right. It's not a ring. And, um, but then I looked at online, like a ball spot and I saw, I saw alopecia, but I thought it, it said, was it alopecia? So I didn't know how to pronounce it, mm-hmm. but, um, but it was through my project. I realized that it was alopecia and, um, and it was, I 
my I lost my hair at that point. I had that bald spot because of stress. Right. You know, so, right. Yeah. Yeah. Your body is. Um, yeah. The body or the immune system attacking the hair thing is something right. unhealthy. Right. It's so amazing. Yeah. The body itself is amazing. We can talk about that all day. But then too, how it affects yeah. us, the things we don't think about, uh, whether it's what we're putting in our body, but definitely stress and those kind of things, how it affects different parts of us. Yes. Yeah, that's so important to understand that, too, because if not, I mean, any, anything can happen. I know, you know, a woman that has lost a baby from stress or lost all of her hair and it's mm-hmm. grown back or um, stroke, like everything, you know. Right. Now, on Instagram, I saw a quote. This was from a while ago, but it said, the beauty you see in me is a reflection of you. And I yes. think it's from Rumi. It was on one of your beautiful pictures. Yes. So with this project, what do you hope is reflected to viewers from uh, I am more than my hair? Um, I'm hoping that when they see a woman or a little girl, um, and I always say that, uh, I would say the most important thing for me is that for a little girl that sits in her classroom and feels the need to cover up, or maybe she doesn't, maybe she wants to take her, you know, not cover up and, and be free and be, and be bald, um, is that through my project, I'm able to bring awareness that people don't pick on her because of her, mm-hmm. of, the, of her bald head, you know, that, and that they can say, and I look at her and not say, oh my gosh, she looks like she has cancer, but oh my gosh, she has alopecia. You know, how'd you, wh- um, how, when'd, you, when'd you lose your hair? And just have an open conversation, you know, like right. talk about it so that it's not taboo um, and that it's not considered to be um, strange or like alien or um, that um, I know a few other people thought that it can be contagious and just to spread awareness about that. And so that, that that way, that little girl that stepped out of the classroom and, and even inside of her classroom feels confident, you know, and I'm able to somehow bring awareness with that um, so that she is able to be confident in her own skin. Yeah, thank you for sharing that because it, it also triggers something for me, this idea that sometimes I have um, friends who say, with love, of course, oh, right. um, like, why don't you just wear a wig or, you know, just oh, wear okay. this. And it's um, to your point about the little girl is sort of, well, I, I love wigs. I think they're fabulous. Right. But for me, it's sort of like, I don't want to wear a wig in order to cover up something that I feel insecure about. You know, right. and I know people wear them for all reasons. And, you know, women right. who are, as we said, living with cancer might wear them just so people don't ask questions. Right. But that's something I think in your project I hope as you said will sort of raise an awareness or a sensitivity in people in you know don't necessarily suggest that the person cover up whatever that um, that baldness or the reason for that baldness right. is right or what people may think to be lack, like lacking of you know it's not right yeah mm-hmm. right excellent yeah. what would you say especially you having two or three businesses what would you say <laughs> entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman Oh, it is definitely, I would say the one thing is resilience. Um, uh, and also um, that never is determination really seals the deal. You know, so not going down on myself, not only as a woman, but also as a woman of color, because it's, it's much more difficult being a business owner as a woman of color than, um, than anyone else, to be honest. And um, I could just sit around and say, well, you know, I'm, I give up. I'm not going to do this business anymore. I'll just go back to a nine to five um, because it's not working or I'm not. I'm not getting the same results as my female white counterpart, but um, I think resilience is lessons learned from all of my uh, the my downfalls have helped me to become resilient. And I say staying consistently on the path um, because for me, my success is the fact that I'm able to be there for my children. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have the headache of going to a nine to five. I can pop up at their school if I choose to. Uh, what is, you know, to make sure that they're doing on point or just to support them. Um, I'm able to have uh, lunch with my husband um, at certain times of the day that I would not have been able to, to do otherwise. So um, that's success for me. And um, I'm just, you know, staying consistent and being resilient this, despite the challenges. I love that. Now, how do you uh, manage everything with, you know, having your family and the business and then your other projects and things that you do? Do you have certain times that you work on certain things, certain days that you work on certain things? Yes, I do, actually. And um, I know people always say, how do you do it? And I, there's times I sit down, and I'm like, how in the world am I, am I getting all this done? <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, I'm actually, my family is actually in, very involved in what I'm doing. So there's times my daughters are with me or my son comes with me. Um, in the, the, the crowdfunding video, my son was the one playing the piano in the background. Oh. Um, there's my daughters to come with me to help me record. Um, my husband comes with me when I have to hang, uh, an exhibit. So, and then they also come with us sometimes and we have to go and like check out, uh, a job with a client 
and we keep them involved because we want them to understand that it's like you know that it's not just we want them to see the the good sides and the our ups and our and our downs mm-hmm. so that they can understand that um things aren't always consistent and you shouldn't expect everything to be great um but then also keeping them involved uh gives them that uh ent- entrepreneurial mindset um so then i do schedule i make sure i'm really um good with scheduling in between my days like what days i'll look at my schedule okay do i want to do a photo shoot today maybe not because there's too many going on i gotta meet a client so um I'm, i've become really good with scheduling just to make sure that i'm staying on task um and not overwhelming myself at the same time now for your schedule is it mainly just you know your calendar thing in your phone or do you have any other systems or things that you use um so i use both my phone and i, and I have an actual because i love to write so i have a um uh, like a journal, um, actual planner. calendar, mm-hmm. right? Yes, a planner, right? Yes, I do both. Excellent. What would you say your support network looks like? It sounds like your family is very much a part of it. Yeah, that's really honestly, that's really about it. My um, my husband, my children, my grandparents, uh, my mom, and I call my grandparents. My grandparents are really good with. Um, I would say. Uh, they're, actually, they're like the marriage counselors, you know, oh. so I we would call them and say, hey, you know, what do you think? My husband would say, you know, well, this is what Alicia did. What do you think about that? And they're like, well, you know, the two of you guys got to do this. So I feel like they have been really amazing, um, especially in, this, in the society that we live in now, where I feel like there's so much uh, marriages don't last and mm-hmm. families are, are broken apart. And definitely my family is not perfect, but like having my husband and my children um, has been like a start for me with uh, making sure that the family stays consistent and, and close together. Um, and um, But my grandparents have definitely been, I would say that, because once again, I love my, I feel like I learned, you learn so much from your elders. Right. So the lessons that they've learned in life, I take that um, and, you know, and run with it and do whatever and implement that with my family as well. Are they there in Maryland as well? No, so they're in Florida. Oh, they're Florida. Far away. Yeah, they don't like cold. I know, I know that's right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I definitely love that. I always I right. complain about the storms and stuff here in Atlanta, but I do love the weather. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's the, nice. Yeah. yeah. The warm weather is good. So yeah. tell us how we can support you. Hopefully the I hope to get this up in the next few days so that people okay. can catch your project. But tell people where to find you, your website and any social media or anything else you want us to look out for. I'll have links to everything, but just so they can hear it. OK. Yes. Yeah, so the first thing I have all my information, all my contact information is also on my website. So Alicia dot com. And that's A-L-Y-S-C-I-A. Um, also, the support would be great. So even though my crowdfunding campaign ends in just eight days, um, Docs in Progress, the same nonprofit organization, is my fiscal sponsor. So they are fiscally sponsoring um, my project. And so from then on, after my crowdfunding campaign is done, if anyone wants to support, they can uh, make a, a tax deductible donation um, through Docs and Progress, and that's all listed on my website as well. So that would be a huge help just to get me from having just all this footage and all the beautiful images and actually producing it and bringing it to life. So they, yeah. so I should link to Docs and Progress as well? Yes, that would okay. be great, yeah. I'll make mm-hmm. sure I do that. And how okay. much are you trying to raise altogether for the project at this point? How much do you have left to raise? So altogether, I have, the my budget is $186,000. That's both for the film and for my book, mm-hmm. um, I did twenty five thousand dollars on um, Indiegogo mm-hmm. um, just because I'm doing different. You know, I'm doing like multiple platforms. I'm doing that. I'm doing also um, grant funding, um, which thankfully um, I got another grant. But, uh, you know, it's not I, have, I can't I'm not supposed to announce it yet, but okay. um, I did get a grant grant from a local um, organization. Um, and um, and I'm also doing private foundation. So that's all like a part of everything that I'm like, I'm doing, you know, bits and pieces everywhere. That's excellent. And how important is that just doing research and finding other um, sources or resources of support for your project? Because I know sometimes that's something some of us get stuck with, too, sort of like, well, I don't have the money, so I'm not going to do it. Right. And that's vital because if you don't have the I know know if you don't have the money, then it's not you're not able to. So I think that doing the research is is the only way that you can actually really get your project launched off the ground. So uh, one thing I would suggest is sometimes you have a project and um, there's a lot of funding for nonprofit organizations. But if you don't have a nonprofit, the way to go about doing it is to apply for um, nonprofit status through another nonprofit. Um, So since Docs in Progress is a documentary uh, organization um, uh, catered to documentary filmmakers, I apply for a nonprofit status through them through, as a fiscal sponsor. So I would just suggest that anyone else that may have a project that they're working on to look for a local nonprofit organization that 
actually um, uh, has fiscal sponsorship opportunities so that they can um, get grant funding through them. Okay, so fiscal yes. sponsorship opportunities. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. That's excellent advice. And how do you mostly go about finding the programs and grants and things that you're working on? Is it just general research? Go to Google and as you did for in the in the beginning, you mentioned something like that, just doing the research online. Um, so I did the research online, but um, I initially had gone to this, which is another good um, uh, platform, the Foundation Center. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Foundation Center is a it's pretty much like a library um, that you can go to, to all they have is, is grant funding. Um, so they have private grant funding, they have foundations, they also have corporate funding. Um, so you go to this, these, and they're all throughout the States. Um, so you can go to the grant, the foundation center library and do your research there for your particular, so you do keywords based on what you're doing. So for me, it's women, photography, film. Um, so who are those organizations that, that, or companies that grant, um, funding to those three categories. So whatever right. the categories that someone is working on, they would go to the nonprofit, the, I mean, to the foundation center and research that way mm-hmm. to help, you know, um, get grant funding that way. Good. That's a great resource. Yeah. I have to check that out yeah. too. Yeah, because it's in Atlanta too. So definitely, what? you definitely should check that out. Yeah, this yeah. foundation in Atlanta. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I have right. to look that up. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So in closing, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person, whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Hmm, there's quite a few people, but um, I would say, um, okay, so Lane um, Cope was uh, my coach that I hired on my, during my first project in 2012. And I hired her initially thinking that she's just gonna, my whole thought process was she was gonna helped me to get grant funding um, to produce feminine transitions, and that was pretty much it. And what it what she taught me um, first, she taught me about connecting my stories to my passions, and then also really just helping me to understand more than just business, but also my mindset. Mm-hmm. And I would have to say that that has been like one of the the foundation for the work um, that I create because I learned that. Um, discovering myself as well is going to help me to become better at what I do um, and and combine that with what I do to to keep creating the work that I produce um, and it's all based on my own personal story so helping she taught me I felt like she taught me to do a self dig like to really go dig deep and to get to my storyline so that I can also understand why I'm creating what I'm creating and um, how it could help me both professionally and personally. So I'd have to thank Lane for that. I love that. Now, what's her name, Lane? Lane Cobb. So L-A-N-E and then C-O-B-B is her last name. And how did you find her? Was looking for a coach something that was important to you during that time? Do you remember? Or or did Um, you sort of meet her and then decide, I need to work with the coach? um, So, you know, initially I was just like, well, I think I need to work with the coach. I put it out there on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, Does anyone know of a coach? Because I figured, you know, once again, it was like, I just need a coach to help me raise funds. That's what I was thinking about. Um, And so somebody suggested her, uh, a friend of mine actually um, said you should check out. And she was asked to be a part of an organization that I was a part of, a women's organization. Mm -hmm. Um, So I reached out to her. And what I had to say that was very different about Lane than other coaches that I had um, interviewed at that time um, that other people had suggested was that, She's naturally intuitive. Um, so I felt like her intuition really helped with connecting the dots um, with me and then also connecting the dots with the two of us. Um, and um, so anyone that I would say that was looking for a coach definitely has to look for some, someone that they feel like um, makes a connection, you know, right. they feel connected with. I think that's important. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alicia. So much great yeah. advice and resources in addition to the fabulous project that you're doing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for re- reaching out and to responding to me. Of <laughs> course. All right. I was all in your messages like, hey, so send me your email. I want to get it out. <laughs> oh. da, da, da. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Thank you. So before, oh, you, before you go, what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? Um, I would say I know that this I used to, you know, uh, looking at when people would always say this, I was like, oh, whatever they can say that because they have money. But I would definitely repeat this over and over again. Don't give up. Um, if you feel like you really want to do something, and you're passionate about something that it's going to take a lot of hard work um, 
and support. So figure out who that support system is and just keep going. Don't give up. Don't give up. Definitely. Alicia, thank you. Hold on for one second. Okay. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Alicia. Please go to supportissexypodcast.com so you can find out more information about her project and also get links to the great resources that she mentions in this episode. Supportissexypodcast.com. Go to the top, the search icon, and type in Alicia, A-L-Y-S-C-I-A, and her show notes page will pop up with all of the information there. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to our email list. I don't spam. I only send the good stuff, but I don't want you to miss an episode. Great interviews and other great things coming up in the spring into the summer for Support is Sexy. We got a lot of great things planned. So be sure to subscribe while you're there, and you'll also get access to our private mastermind. Women in that group supporting each other as we all create something sexy. All right, so I hope to see you there. So until next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.